Hello, everyone. I'm so glad you are here today. What a wonderful group. I see so many um, names that I know in the chat, and I am honored to be a part of this symposium today, for sure. Um, and it's such a pleasure to get to hear um, everyone else on the panel and what they have to offer. It's, it's pretty amazing. I'm uh, going to share with you my approach to vocal production today. And like I shared in my intro, I actually have a lot of passions when it comes to music. I'm, um, first of all, I'm very passionate about free, easy, open vocal production, about us sounding like ourselves, about um, making, um, joining together with people to make this sound that's bigger than ourselves. I'm also really, really um, passionate about authentic performing and how us sounding like ourselves can add to that authenticity and also watching a variety of um, vocalists and discovering how they draw us into performances and what we can do to emulate that. And also just about the culture of our singing organization, our choruses, our choirs, um, everything working together with transparent communication, empowering leaders, and um, just making sure that that culture is something that's healthy and thriving and growing and brings in new members because we want everyone to be able to experience what we've experienced in music and, and drawing people in really makes a difference in people's lives. So many things, but today I'm mainly going to concentrate on vocal production and I'm going to share with you um, a class that usually takes me an hour. Yay! So obviously I'm going to not go as in depth on some things as I might usually, but you will have access to this, um, to this presentation and also my email. So if I say or do anything during this and you have questions about it, you can ask the questions in the question answer box, but you can also email me later on if you wanna go more in depth on some things. And of course, I can't see everyone's face, but I'm going to assume you are smiling and nodding at me and laughing uproariously at any joke I might happen to make today. All right, so I'm going to share my screen with you all. Let me grab that real quickly. Oh, I'll probably do both of those. Here we go. And I always, I, I loved this image as I was working on this presentation. I love the idea of all of these things happening um, underneath like an iceberg. And then at the top, we just sing, we share what we have with our audience. So I just, I really do love uh, that image for this. So um, I'm going to go th and, and I want to share just a little bit for a long time as a director and singer, I did things because other people told me to do them. I didn't really think about why I was doing what I was doing. And because of that, I didn't always adopt the most healthy vocal practices that I could have because I didn't take the time to understand why things worked physiologically with our voices the way they do. And incidentally, um, Oh, yeah, hold on. Oh, so yes, Sue, um, part of that reason is um, she's asking me about changing to full screen. Let me just take this out. Hold on just a second, my friends. I'm going to share it this way, but it's going to take me just a second. But while I'm talking, so a lot of what I did was because someone told me to do it. I didn't think about why it was right or why it might work with my voice. And then also what I was doing was I didn't even realize creating a lot of tension in my voice because I wasn't thinking about how that worked naturally. So I'm gonna share it from here. Let me grab this real quickly, my friends. Here it is. Thank you for, this is the time where you get to watch me watch my screen, which I always think is the most exciting time when we're presenting online, right? All right, so let me grab this. I think this might be easier for people to see. Let's find out. I hope it is. I found that as I use this, sometimes it shows up blurry at first and then people are able to see it more easily. We'll see if that works for this for sure. And I know my screen's black, there we go. So um, as we talk about the different aspects of vocal production, um, I wanted to look at the why, not only um, 
the just you should do this. So as we talk, we always go back to alignment, right? If our instrument isn't aligned, then our vocal mechanism isn't going to be able to work the way it should. So um, as we look at alignment, why do we do it? I always just was like, you know, my mom always told me to sit up straight and I did, and I had good posture because she told me to, but why is it important for singing? Um, so basically, it's so that our skeleton, our skeleton can do the work it's supposed to do so that our muscles don't have to. And I'm especially talking about the muscles around our vocal folds, around our vocal mechanism. So for instance, if my head is not in alignment, if my spinal cord is not supporting my head the way it should, then my, um, my vocal tract is going to be out of alignment. I'm going to have tension. These muscles are going to have start to do work that they weren't meant to do. A lot of times if you're experiencing vocal fatigue after a rehearsal, a lot of times it has to do with alignment because those muscles are having to do extra duty. So as you know, our heads are very heavy. If you remember from Jerry Maguire, the human head weighs eight pounds. Oh, and by the way, I am going to ask you to sing and do this stuff with me today. So I hope you enjoy that. Um, I just like, I like having you all sing with me for sure. So um, making sure that the head is aligned. Basically, I just think about my head being above my spinal cord. I know, duh, right? But sometimes it doesn't always live there. And then making sure that the back of my neck is as tall as it can possibly be. So that none of the muscles around my vocal mechanism are tense or are having to do work they're not supposed to do. And I have other exercises in here for alignment as well. And you will have access to this. So I'm just going to go past that for now, but just determining that there is as, as less tension in the muscles as possible, as least tension as possible, and making sure that the skeleton is supporting us as we sing. And really, as we live, as we walk, as we work, that skeleton should be doing its job. But I'm just gonna invite you to make sure that it is nice and aligned, that your head is above your spinal cord, the back of your neck is, uh, is tall and so that the vocal mechanism is relaxed. And if we're singing something easy like, V, 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 if I'm slightly out of alignment, if my chin's a little bit out of alignment, V, 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 you can hear the tension in my voice already. But if I make sure my head is above my spinal cord, make sure the back of my neck is nice and tall, V, 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 my vocal mechanism can do what it's supposed to do. So I'm gonna invite you, especially in um, the time of Zoom where my camera is a little higher in my screen. And so I end up looking up at the camera or I don't know if you all are like me. Sometimes I feel like I'm emoting. If I stick my chin out like this, somehow I'm emoting where really you just get to look up my nose. Um, really thinking about that alignment as I work on Zoom and as I think about emoting is really important. Oh, Jennifer Palis, I love your questions. I know we're going to answer those later, but I appreciate you asking. The next thing, and you may have heard of this many, many times already, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. And I'm going to tell you why I love them. They have changed the way I sing, you all. Um, basically, what happens when we start singing is there's a buildup of pressure below our vocal folds or subglottally. And that causes some muscling in when we sing. It just naturally happens that way. But if we can do a semi-occlusion in the vocal tract above the vocal folds or supraglottally, which is just fun to say, <laughs> thank you, Vicki, um, then we can create this back pressure that equalizes the pressure above and below the vocal folds and allows our vocal folds to adduct the way they should. It allows them to touch the way they should very naturally, very easily. And you will find that you are not able, not only able to sing more easily, but 
You can actually sing lower and higher in your range. And it also gets you through your passaggio, through your break much more easily. It has been fabulous. And I'm going to ask you to try this with me. I know I can't see you, but I know you're gonna sing with me right now. Now, there are a lot of different ways that you can create that semi-occlusion above your vocal folds. And I have some of them listed here. You can lip trills, tongue trills, um, singing through a straw, all of that good stuff. But my favorite is the voice fricative, mainly because I just love saying the word fricative. It's fun to say fricative, but also I just love the fact that you have voice fricatives with you no matter where you go, because it's just naturally occurring sounds when you speak or sing. So you can see the voice fricatives are V, Z, a voiced TH like V and Z. That was my right way of writing Z, Z, which sounds very French, Z. And so you'll notice if I sing, just I'll do that same pattern that I just did. V, 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 V. And now that I know the subglottal pressure is there, I can feel it when I, when I do this stuff. It's, I'm like, oh, I kind of wish I didn't know that, but it's there and now I know. So I'm gonna sing that again. And then I'm going to add the voice fricative at the beginning, that semi-occlusion to create that back pressure. So here's how it sounds again without that. V, 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 V. Now I'm going to add that voice fricative. V, 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 V. And you can probably already hear my voice sounds fuller. It sounds more relaxed. My vocal folds are able to adduct more cleanly and it just, it feels wonderful. So I'm gonna ask you to do it with me if you haven't been already. I know we have a variety of vocal ranges joining us right now, but just sing where you feel comfortable, but I'm gonna have you sing without the voice fricative and then with, and if you feel a difference, please feel free to put it in the chat. I just love to hear, you know, that um, feedback as we go through this, all right? Let's try it, here we go. V, 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 V. And now adding the voice fricative. V, 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 V. And that just helps me create that back pressure that goes through. And I will tell you all, I don't just use it in my initial warm ups. I use it when I'm making learning tracks and I get to a part that's tricky and I, my voice isn't just feeling it. Sometimes I'll just sing it on that voice fricative. And then sing through it again and my vocal folds are like, oh yes, this is how I'm supposed to work, thank you. So I encourage you to use these exercises often because they really do help. Oh, I love that, Judy. Yo, you're feeling the differences, I love that. And I also have some resources just, uh, I'm sure Kathleen will share too. She has a great video on semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. Jordan Travis does a great thing with a funnel because you can actually use funnels and cups with holes in the bottom, all sorts of things to create that um, semi-occlusion. And then this uh, wonderful friend of mine, ja Jamie Claire Archer has two videos, one on the science behind it and then one on some exercises you can do to create that. I use it all the time. It's very much worth using. Sorry, I'm going so fast through this. I hope I'm not making anyone dizzy. <laughs> oh, Y'all, so this, I love this picture of the um, side of the person's head, the cross section, because you can tell this thing has seen some stuff. Like it's been in a science room for like 20 years, but I love it because it shows not only the vocal mechanism and all, all this stuff here, and we're gonna talk about the soft palate and the tongue, but look how huge the tongue is, you all. It's so big. It takes up so much of our, our vocal space. And when we pull the tongue back or when we lower the back of the tongue, it creates a lot of tension in our voice that we do not need. For a long time, I was taught to really raise my soft palate and really lower my tongue so I could create resonance in the back of my throat. And really all I was creating was tension and any kind of tension in the back of the throat. And we did a lot of this on the inhale. Um, so just 
that created just a lot of tension that, that was unnecessary. And it was also affecting my tonal center because as I create this space in the back of my throat, it takes more cycles per second of air to create a tone that is, is on pitch. And so let's talk about how we can create a completely resonant tone without having to do all that micromanaging in the back of our throat. I'm keeping track of time. I'm going through this, y'all. <laughs> so with the tongue, I notice when I naturally speak, my tongue stays forward in my mouth. It rarely pulls back. It rarely pulls down in the back of the throat. And so why, when I sing, do I do this with my tongue where I start micromanaging and pulling it back and down? Um, so a lot of times I use the vowel E because E naturally brings the front of the tongue forward and it naturally brings the sides of the tongue up to touch your upper molars. And it brings the back of the tongue off of your vocal folds and out of the way. And so if we sing that same pattern, just sing it on an E for me and sing with me. Ready, here we go. E. And if you're someone who naturally just is used to really lifting your soft palate right, right now, and you may be doing it even on the E, let's just say E, 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 E. Feel how it naturally feels when you say it, just like as if you were saying it to someone, E. Now sing it that way. E. And you can feel how the tongue gets out of the way of your resonating space and it's forward in your, in your face and just floating where it should be basically. And it looks like a Pringles chip when you do that. That's why I love the, the Pringles position. I have a whole story about the Pringles and everything, which I can't go into right now, but it really does work. And so if I go from like an E to an A, ah, e, and this is with me moving my tongue a lot. E, oh. You can hear I lose resonation and I lose tonal center. But if I keep the E more in front of my face, more in that Pringles position, more in the E position, e you can feel that it is more in the tonal center, more in that same resonating space. So keeping the tongue out of the way, floating and free is very important when we're singing. I'm going through this fast, y'all. <laughs> And then the same thing with the soft palate. The soft palate already has a natural rise. We don't need the overachievers that we are as musicians. We don't need to hyperextend our soft palate to create a good sound. A lot of times if you'll just sing, ba, 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 the B consonant will get that soft palate in that natural raise where you don't have to do anything extra with it. So if I do, Ba 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 v v v v v v v v v. I can feel that natural raise of the soft palate, and I don't have to do anything extra with it to make it shift up. Because if you raise it too far, you're actually closing off some resonators and some things going on that um, naturally occur when you sing that that get in your way. I always say two jobs for me as a coach. Number one is to make sure the mechanism is working the way it should. Number two is to get ourselves out of our own way. If it feels too easy, it's probably right, my friends. So let's try that just so you can feel that. Sing that with me. We're going to do ba 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 and then v v v. Ba 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 v v v v v v v v v. And that gets us in that natural, warm, resonant tone without us having to micromanage the back of your throat. And the funny thing is the way we did that and the way I taught it for a long time was through the inhale. I was teaching when you inhale, raise the back of your throat, create that space, put the golf ball in the back of your mouth. And all I was doing was creating tension when we breathe in, which we don't need. A lot of what I do now is breathing as if I were speaking. So if I'm going to say somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, that breath is, is so natural and so easy and it gives me the air I need. Now, if I tank up and really breathe in, and I know we're at um, uh, question and answer time, so I'll do this real quickly and I'll go right into that. If I'm breathing in big and trying to tank up, 
Somewhere over the rainbow. You can hear how much tension I have. But if I breathe as if I were going to say it, somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high. It has a lot more natural resonance and it's so much easier because the more tense you get in the back of your throat, the more tension you have with your breathing, the, the less you're going to sound free and easy and open and like yourself. And I'm going to stop it there. I do have, there's some more things about relaxed natural breathing that you'll be able to read in the presentation. And then basically at the top, it's just, these are all the things that we do with our mechanism so we can breathe and have free open singing. So I'm going to awesome, stop Jen. Thank oh, you thanks, so Sarah. much. Jennifer Palace asks, when aligning um, and you want the back of the neck tall, is chin down to create that back of neck, neck length or chin parallel to floor in good alignment? So that's a great question, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I tend to not talk about the chin so much when I talk about alignment. That's just something that has worked for me because I find that the more I think about my chin, the less natural I get with where my head position is. But if I think about my neck, which is supporting my head already and just think, okay, the back of my head's nice and tall. I find that that puts my chin in the position it's supposed to be in because you know, we're all made very differently. And so um, sometimes when I tell someone tuck your chin or put it parallel to the floor, it ends up being more of a micromanaging type of thing. So I tend to concentrate just on that neck length to make sure that it feels really natural and this is really, really free. And along those lines might be a similar answer. Gloria yeah. asks, any tricks for maintaining good head posture when singing from the top row of the risers? She Amen. finds herself lowering her chin to see the director. Yes, I know. And um, Gloria, I feel your pain because uh, I've also sung on the back row of the risers a lot. I find that a lot of times I have to allow my eyes to do more of the work than my head. It feels weird. It doesn't look as weird as it feels. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be glad to know. But really, because it's much more important that that head position remain in alignment um, just using your eyes only to look down at the director and maintaining that head, it does take some practice and sometimes it can feel tense. You've got to make sure you let that tension go, but let your eyes follow the director more than your head. And from far away audience perspective, it just looks like you're singing out to them, which is what we want anyway. Great question. And, and it looks like several people love fricative, just like you do. Um, <laughs> Susan asks, uh, you know, a favorite example of a tag or something that has a voice fricative. How do you add the fricative? Some other fricative comments. And oh, I just love saying it three times. <laughs> I know, right? It's a great word. <laughs> well, uh, Susan Casey, I love you. I don't, I don't have a tag off the top of my head that has voice fricatives, but anything that has love or the, or Z, Z, I don't know, zoo, anything like that can really help with that. And a lot of times I'll just put the fricative in, like for instance, when I went back to somewhere over the rainbow, one of my favorite warmups because it traverses the octave. And, but if I'm having trouble with it, I may go over the rainbow. I may like add it in anywhere basically while I'm working on a song to make sure my vocal folds are ducting in those places. And a lot of times it's in the lows and highs, louds and softs that I feel I start to build up that subglottal pressure again. And I just put it back in there. And I tell my chorus members, if you wanna sing on a voice fricative anytime, do it because that's you being aware of what you need vocally to, to make sure your vocal folds are working the way they should. So, you know, put those fricatives in wherever you can. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jen. You were amazing as always. Uh, and I put your link to your PowerPoint and your other links in the chat. And we'll see you again on the round table. Wonderful. So excited. Thank you all so much for giving me your time. I enjoyed it very much.